We're starting Perek Hamishi in Pirkei Avot. Officially, it's the last Perek of Pirkei Avot, even though there is a Perek Shishi, which is uh, a Braita. It was added in addition to Pirkei Avot. So traditionally, we read all of them when we go through the entire Pirkei Avot during the summer months. So I haven't made yet the decision whether we'll go through the sixth Perek or not. It's a little bit different, but we'll see, depending on our time. This perek is, is, is quite different than the other prakim where we hear advice from the various rabbis in different areas of life. Here you will notice in the next couple of weeks that the Mishnayot are organized by numbers. There's groups of tens, there's groups of seven, fours, of certain events or certain ideas that exist in a certain group of number. So the Mishnayot goes through the various groups of tens. For example, we're going to be starting with a group of ten. Ten ma'amarot, ten utterances of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the creation of the world. And obviously there is a reason why these are chosen. These are significant uh, ideas and they represent certain, uh, not only events in our history, but also certain concepts that are important. So it's not just because of a number that they just that are just mentioned. It just happens to be that they are divided in various groups represented by a certain number. So we're going to begin with a group of tens. In Mishnah Aleph, the Mishnah reads, Ma'asara ma'amorot nivra ha'olam. The world was created with ten utterances. Right? Hashem said, let there be light, let there be a world, let there be this, let there, let's create a man. Right? So let there be is an utterance. And there are ten utterances. Even though you may count nine, Bereshit bara lokim dashamayim v'ta'at is also an utterance. So, however you look at it, there, the creation occurs in stages, not only does it occur over an entire week, over six days, it also occurs in separate utterances. Matalmud Lomar, what's the significance of this? What is this teaching us? It could have easily, just as easily, Hashem could have made a world. Let there be a world. Why is Hashem separating each one, giving it its own time frame, its attention, specifying what it is in detail almost, that I made this, I made this, I made this, all separately. What for? Just say everything at once. Let there be a world, and Hashem knows what He wants in this world. We know that there are no extra words in the Torah. Everything is for a reason. So what is the reason? That it is done, creation is done by Asara Mamorot. So before we go on and see the answer of the Mishnah, what do, you, what do you think about the number 10? As we said, these are groups of numbers. So maybe there's something to the number 2. Well, what does 10 remind you of? What is there other than 10 ma'amaro, 10 utterances? Sure. That, you know? huh? 10 people for us, sir. A minyan? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Commandments. Commandments, mm-hmm. okay. So apparently 10 is a powerful number. I mean... There are other powerful numbers, but in different ways. Ten somehow is something that is complete. The numbers are from one to ten, right? And then it begins to be eleven and twelve. They're all based on ten. So we have ten levels in a sense. Ten commandments. Ten as, as a group forms a minyan where there's Kedusha, where the Shekhinah resides, ten sefirot of the Kabbalah, emanations, attributes of Hashem. So apparently, apparently I'm saying, ten does represent a significant number per se, and anything that is associated with it apparently is somehow related to it. We may never know exactly how it's related, but we're going to see how Possibly, there is a relationship over here to the Mahamarot. 
But in asking this question, the, the, the Mishnah wanted to know what is the purpose of, you know, of uh, breaking it down, creation into s- several utterances, where it could easily have been done with one. So the Mishnah answers, Hashem punishes the wicked for destroying a world that was created with ten utterances, and to give reward to the tzaddikim, to the righteous, who sustained the world that was created with ten utterances. Okay. So Hashem is going to punish the Rashaim for being destructive of such a world and pay the tzaddikim for, for maintaining it, for sustaining it. But still, what, what's the significance of doing it in 10? It, it doesn't really say it very clearly. But if you look closely at the words, it is repeating the, the fact that the point that this world was created by Asara Mamarot, not with one Ma'amar. This world is precious. This world Hashem created with care, with attention, with purpose. Not just, let there be a world. A world. No, this world is purposeful. This world is by design. It's custom made. By Asara Mamarot He made it. He didn't make it with one Ma'amar. So, if anything, this shows care. This shows that this is something precious to Hashem. The world, life, is special. It's purposeful. There's a reason for it. And the more precious something is, if somebody comes along and tries to ruin it, Hashem is upset. Not only Hashem, I mean, if you did something that you took a lot of care, you gave a lot of attention, and somebody, you would also be upset. That's the point here. Whatever is given so much attention, whatever is given so much care, Hashem went to the trouble, not that it's a trouble for him, but right to create something in such detail for a very important purpose, then obviously those who destroy it, Hashem Mekalkelim, this world, will pay. Why do we need to know that? Well, we do know that part of creation involves Midat Adin. There are judgments in the world. When you see all kinds of terrible things happening, you sh- we, we need to realize that this is Midat Adin. There's such a thing as a freak accident, as they're going to call it. There are no accidents, freak accidents. It's only Shabbat, Midat Adin. And when there's terrible calamities and terrible disasters, it's, it's the attribute of justice. Something is happening that is being mekalkel, this beautiful world. And in order to balance things out, Hashem has to be nifra mina reshaim from the wicked who are ruining it, who are causing this. This is his way of letting people know that something is wrong. And he cares. It's not just that this is the way he wanted it to be. No, it's not just that. Because, you know, if people don't want to do what's right, okay. You know, perhaps they can just live their life as they wish. Hashem says, no, you can't just live your life as you wish because Many a times when a person does certain things, he's actually destroying the world for others. Take, for example, billboards. Filthy billboards. Filthy advertisement. They say it's free, it's free freedom of speech. Yeah, but freedom of the speech cannot be granted if it is hurting others. You can't use your freedom of speech al cheshbon acherim, to ruin other people's lives? You won't give it that kind of a freedom. If it doesn't hurt other people, fine. It's a democracy. But not if it will interfere with others. No, let them put on sunglasses. Let them shut their eyes. No, we want to live a normal life. We want to be able to walk and see. And not to, be see, to see all kinds of things. So there are people who are destructive in their behavior, who do things that destroy this world. And Hashem, of course, cannot tolerate that. Because this is a, supposed to be a beautiful world, not a world where people will be destructive of it. In order for the world to survive, in order to, for the world to reach its purpose, for, in order for everything to be accomplished that Hashem wishes to accomplish, He cannot a- allow things to go on like this forever without interfering. So He's letting us know that 
if it's Be'asarama Marot, is to leave para, to punish the Rishayim who destroy it. And why do they get punished so harshly? Because it's ten Ma'amarot, it's not one, it's something more precious. It's not an ordinary world, it's a precious world. So the destruction is commensurate with the fact that this is precious, it's more serious. And to reward the Tzadikim, who of course are vigilant in observing the mitzvot and doing their best they can to, to bring this world to the ultimate Akhli, to its purpose, to do the will of Hashem. And they are kaimim et haolam. They are the ones that make the world go on and, and stand and survive. So they are, their reward will be immense, not just a plain reward. Their reward will be immense because of the importance of their job. Their job is, is, has so much responsibilities, therefore it pays more. So you wonder why the tzaddikim are so rewarded. Yes, because of what they do. They do tremendous work. It's not just that they're nice people and righteous and behave themselves and pray three times a day, you know, and, and give charity. That's very nice. No, no, the act, those deeds actually do tremendous, tremendous things for this world on a, on a spiritual and on a physical level. Kabbalistically, every avera diminishes the light in this world. Every Avera brings darkness, brings death into the world. On a spiritual level, it's destructive. And every mitzvah brings light, and brings life. It does something for this world. So the ma'asim, the deeds of the reshaim, are very destructive in ways which we cannot see always. And the ma'asim of the tzaddikim are very uplifting. Very, very, they are the ones that build this world. And man, being the most important part of creation, was created at the end, at the sixth day, to remind him that this world is for you. I am putting you at the end because I prepared everything beforehand. This whole world that Hashem is creating is for us. And of course, it's not just for us, it's for us to be involved in maintaining it and and fixing whatever needs to be fixed on a spiritual, on the spiritual plane. So we are being constantly reminded that this is our responsibility, and that is why we've been given free will, created in the image of God, and in the same way that the world is special, man is special. All of creation is special, all the creatures are special because they all serve a purpose, but man is the crown of creation. Man is the one that has the most responsibilities because so much depends on him. What's interesting about these ma'amarot is that each one being separate means that each one is independent of the other. What does that mean, independent? It means that evolution is out of the question. Now, I'm not saying micro-evolution. There's micro and there's macro. Macro means big, like they claim man came from monkey. That's too much of a change. Micro means there's a small changes. If you live in this country, your skin will be darker over time. Yeah. People evolve. You know, the human being, the physical body can have minor changes, but not major changes that he will be a different species. There were monkeys in the beginning of creation too. Each one being a separate mama, therefore it tells us there is a complete separation between cre creatures. There's no connectivity between them. It's not like, oh, I made monkeys, you know, and eventually they evolved into other kinds of species. No. Each one is created separately. Separate ma'amarot, separate days, separate nivraim, without any evolution in between them. That, that's just another idea that I thought of. That perhaps by being separate, they're mean, meaning they're independent of each other. There's no connection between them. Now, as far as kilkul ha'olam, reshaim are mekalkelim, or may abdim, as it says here, they destroy the world. In the past, it wasn't so apparent. You couldn't really see what does it mean for a human being to do, be destructive of the world. People, you know, were selfish. People fought many wars. They killed right and left. But you, you couldn't really see that the world was being destroyed. Today, man has so much power, he can destroy the world with atomic weapons by contaminating it. Today man has become so powerful in many ways that he sees now, he has become aware of his ability of being destructive. 
But he only sees this on a physical level. He doesn't really see the spiritual damage that he causes. Until all of a sudden there's a bunch of kids that are killed in school. Then that wakes up, that somehow, I hope it did, wakes up and shocks people. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Go back to school, go back to your upbringing, go back to the rotten education that's been infiltrating, not just in this country, all over the world, right? Through the promiscuity, through the internet, through the TV, and through all this negative kind of upbringing that has allowed this, this kind of, of phenomena to, uh, to emerge. In other words, obviously something is wrong somewhere. If it happens once in a blue moon, we say, oh, he's, he must have been crazy. Okay. You know, he was depressed. That was in the past also. But when you hear all kinds of things like that all the time, then you wonder, maybe, maybe we are doing something wrong. So it's not just on a physical level. Spiritually, the lack of religion, the lack of the belief in God, in the schools, separation, church from state, right? Leaving God out means there's no fear of God, meaning that everything is just physical, material. The people do have everything they can ever have wished for. Anything you want, you can get today. <laughs> so why are people so unhappy? Right, so there's something wrong. So today people are able to see to the extent of the damage that they are causing through their maasim. You had, a, you had a beautiful place called Sdom Ve'amora. Yes, once upon a time it was beautiful. Not too, not too far from Yama Melech. It was green. It was fertile. Go there today, you think it's the moon. You think you're on the moon. Completely barren for the most part. Dead sea, it's called. Nothing there. Salt. From the Ma'apecha back then. Of course, this is all from the sulfur, from the, from the earthquake from back then. It has remained till then. And if you want to see a little bit of a few green areas, you have to go to Engedi. There are a few oases in that area where you see a little bit of greener waterfalls. Fresh water, beautiful. In the middle of all this desert. How's that? Hashem left a few places, a few corners here and there to see what this was once upon a time. What happened there? The Maasim of the inhabitants of that locate, of that area ruined it. These people ruined it for themselves. They ruined the whole entire area. And you know, the Midrash, you know who Stoba Amora was. They did anything you can imagine. Terrible, corrupt, in many ways. So that's an example of a place that was destroyed through people's Maasim. And Kilkelu, they ruined it. It was good. So we see how man has the ability through his influence to negatively affect his surroundings. Negatively affect his surroundings. One of the best examples, and the most incredible of all, is how the tobacco company tries so, so hard to convince all of you, and convince me too, but they, they haven't succeeded yet, mm -hmm. to convince a lot of people to buy poison and pay for it. And I say they try hard because they've had lawsuits. They spent billions of dollars, maybe, on defending themselves that they can, they have, they can sell this. And finally, they came to some sort of agreement, I guess. I don't know all the details. They have to put a label. This may not be healthy. You know, this may not be. I forget the exact language of it. A surgeon or something. Yeah, exactly. You remember the language it says there? No, I think you don't smoke probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It may be, it may harm your health. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the only compromise they reached. But they're making millions of dollars selling poison. So here you see a, a good example of where man has the ability to hurt, to harm, and even to make money on it. It's it's incredible. Incredible. And they allow it. So anyway, so that is the, the, the essence of what the rabbis are telling us about how precious the world is because it serves a certain purpose. The mitzvot 
are the only ones that lead to that purpose, to that tachlit. Averot take us away, distance us from that tachlit. And as a result of that, there is a kilkul, the world suffers. If the tachlit is not being done, then you know, the world is not really doing what it's supposed to be doing. And it's supposed to be a place where Hashem will reign. Am Yisrael was supposed to be a light unto the nations in order to, to, to be the leader. We did not always do a good job. But that is ultimately what could have happened through the medium called mitzvot. Because the mitzvot bring about an elevation to the world. It's a spiritual elevation. And if that would happen, then the physical reality would also be much better. And I've said this a few times, that the fact that we have bugs in our vegetables, think of for that, for example, bugs in vegetables, you know about that, right? There's bugs, some places I have to really check. Israel has a lot of problems with that, the infestation. What do you think that is? That's not good, that's not ideal. Why should I have such a hard time? I mean, it's enough to lechem. It's enough that I have to work hard to plow the field, put the seed in the ground, harvest it. Now I have to worry about bugs, and wash it, and soap, and this. It's not a beracha. This means that there's no beracha. It's not a real beracha. There's partial beracha, that Baruch Hashem is food, but I have to work harder now. That's not good. That's not a good sign. If the weather is not good, right? If the weather is nasty, not even a hurricane, just no good. Where people suffer from it, from over too much heat, too much cold, extremes, it's no good. Do you know that before the Mabul, the entire earth was subtropical? With a mist, green, no deserts, no north and south pole. Right? The, the axis of the earth was pretty much even, level. There was no seasons or to make great change of seasons. It was beautiful. There could be some, of course, changes of temperature, depending if you went north or south, but for the most part, it wasn't uh, anything extreme. It was beautiful. People lived long. People were not sick. It tells you something. that This is a, a world in a perfected state from a Shem standpoint. Man is the one that ruins it. Hashem says, I won't let them live so long. 969 years for somebody to, what is he going to do with all that time? Play shesh pish? You know, backgammon? You know. What are you going to do with 969 years? It's, it's funny, you know, it's interesting to find, why did Hashem allow them to live so long in the very beginning? Not anymore. What do they hear here? 115, it's a world record. So think about it, because Hashem is t- telling us this is the potential. This is what the world was like. <clears throat> the fruit, the rabbis tell us in the time of the, before the Churban, they were so nutritious. Today, today you take an orange, an apple, a tomato for sure, not. It doesn't have any taste. So the Gemara says all the fruits have lost the nutritious value, the real taste, ever since the Churban Bet HaMikdash. Go to Israel, the fruits are better, it tastes good, but not, not the same like it was before. The world has changed. People have changed. And that's because of our fault. When Mashiach comes very soon, the world, of course, will be restored to what it was. Once upon a time, the Berakha will come back and everything will be, wow, so much different. But uh, today, there's so much imperfection and that's as a result of man's imperfection. So we see that man's imperfection mekalkel. And therefore, Hashem has to punish the Rashaim who are responsible for that, for this precious world. Look what they're doing, the damage that they're doing. And it's not just because He wants them to, to be punished. Hashem would prefer that nobody would be punished, like the Pasuk says several times in the Naviyesh, Ki lo hamet, o rasha. Hashem says, I would rather for the Rasha not die. I, would not, I do not want the wicked to die. Kim I want him to return so that he should live. I want people to live, not to die. That's why I bring him into this world. 
But what can I do? Sometimes they don't learn. Sometimes they don't know. They don't realize. You know, what can I do? I can't let let the world run if care by itself and just let people do what they want. So I have to punish. Punish in this sense means to send the message out. You are destructive. We said that the ten mamarot correspond to the ten commandments. What uh, what what kind of a a connection could there be here? So let's look at the next Mishnah. Asara dorot me Adam ad Noach. There were ten generations from Adam till Noach. Why ten? Again, we're number 10, right? They were no good, except for a few individuals here and there. Hanoch, Metushelach, a few individuals who were so-so. They were all bad. So why didn't Hashem destroy them earlier? Hashem only waited till Noah to bring him a bull, right? <laughs> 10 generations he waited, from Adam to Noah. This is to tell us, to, to teach us how much tolerance Hashem has and patience. He waits for people to do Teshuvah. He doesn't want to destroy the world. They were all being destructive. All these generations were being destructive. They were angering Hashem. Until in the end, He brought the Mabul, the flood. So why ten? So 10 corresponds, one explanation to the 10 commandments. So I saw one commentary say that every single generation stopped fulfilling one. In other words, there was a constant yerida, tadorot, there was a constant going down, weakening, distancing from Hashem. Every generation gave up like one of the commandments until all of the commandments were gone. And why is there a need for Mabu? Because there's no Am Yisrael at that time who does keep the Ten Commandments. Once Am Yisrael comes into the scene, Hashem doesn't have to destroy the world anymore. Once the Torah will be given, there won't be a need to destroy the entire world. Locally, there is destruction here and there. But for the entire world to be destroyed, there's no more need. Because there is an Am Yisrael that keeps the Ten Commandments, that keeps the mitzvot, right? But till then, there was no. So that's one connection between the ten generations and ten commandments because there was a constant yerida, constant weakening, going away from God, and therefore there was no choice but to destroy the world through the Mabul. But why did Hashem wait? Because it shows us that Hashem is not eager to destroy. Important lesson. If there is <coughs> destruction, it must be after their, as the rabbis tell us, their bag filled up. Their bag filled up with sins. Otherwise, Hashem would not be so destructive. He would rather, like he with Ninveh, he sent you not. Do Teshuvah, return to Hashem. This is a precious world. Every creation is His creation. They're all in the image of God. Hashem cares about everyone, right? So therefore, this is an important lesson. Erech He has Erech And you, when you see Rashaim that appear to be getting away with it, don't think that Hashem is just forgetting about it. He's giving them a chance. Maybe one day that Rasha will do Teshuvah. Hashem is not eager in destroying him, in taking him away from this world. Asara Dorot Minoach Ad Avraham. Then we have another 10 generations from Noah until Abraham. Here they're again, destructive in a different way, but also destructive. Why 10? Just see how much Erech Apayim Hashem has. Again, 10 generations he waits. <coughs> Now here, the, the Hashem did not punish. Here, Hashem did not, I mean, even though the, the Tower of Babel was destroyed, and even though there was a little bit of a punishment that these nations were scattered, and from then on, the languages got all mixed up, but it was not the same as it was before. 
But still it shows that Hashem was waiting. What was He waiting for? He was waiting for an individual that will come from whom He will be able to establish a nation eventually, from whom He will be able to build this world. And that was Abraham Avinu. So, שכל הדורות היו מכניסים בהם עד שבא אברהם וקיבל עליו שכר כולם. Until Abraham is the only one that came and received the reward for everyone. What does that mean, receive the reward for everyone? What was everyone supposed to do? What everyone could, should have done, he did all on his own. And that is to discover Hashem, to reveal it and to teach it, and to guide others by these teachings. And להרבות בחסד to increase the amount of chesed that one does for each other. Because the Dora Mabul and Dora Palaga were very weak in this area. They were more selfish, especially Dora Mabul. They didn't care about others. Abraham Avinu is the first one that personifies chesed. He cares about others. He prays for others. He calls out to Hashem, saves Dom. Perhaps there's some Sadiqim there. Look how much he cares. He goes out of his way to save people to teach them the ways, as it says, he made souls. What does it mean he made souls? He brought them Tachak Kanfesh Shekhinah. Tremendous achievement. Him and his wife Sarah. So Abraham Avinu Kibel Sachar Kulam, he did what everyone else should have done. He on his own did it. What a tremendous achievement for one person. Look how much one person can do. So this is the man Hashem was waiting for. Why is he waiting for this man? Imagine someone spent a lot of money digging digging for diamonds. It's a big investment. He spent lots of money drilling. Nothing was found. So he's very disappointed. A lot of money, a lot of time and effort, and nothing found. So he tries again and, and pours more money into the investment. Doesn't find anything. He feels terrible. But he tries one more time, and finally he finds one big diamond. And that diamond is so beautiful and so big that it compensates him for all the money that he spent. Can you imagine how happy he would be? That's Abraham Avinu. Hashem put so much into the world, so much invested. People, generation after generation, nothing happens. Finally, finally, there's one individual that comes out that finally pretty much does what Hashem wants him to do. To teach people the right derech in life, the right things, the right path. That idols is something that they should totally let go of, it's total nonsense. This is the truth, what he teaches them. Put an emphasis on chesed, which is what Hashem cares about. So emet and chesed, emunah. So he's the first one. And that is why Abraham Avinu is so rewarded. But why Abraham and not Noah? Noah was also a good man. What's the difference between Abraham and Noah? So the commentaries explain in Yiddish, there's an expression, a tzaddik in pelts. Let's assume that this room is cold. I turn on the heater, so now it's warm. But let's assume it's cold. There's two ways you can become warm. One is you put on a fur coat, a warm coat. Another one is you turn on the heat. What's the difference? If you put on a, a fur coat, you're going to be warm yourself. Everybody else will be cold. If you turn on the heat, you get everybody to be warm. There are some tzaddikim who are tzaddikim in pelts, as they say in Yiddish. In other words, they, they take care of their own tzidkut, of their own righteousness. They don't go out of the way to be mekhar of others and to teach others. They're just by themselves. They really are tzaddikim, but by themselves. That was Noah. Noah didn't go out of his way to be mekhar even though it's true that had he tried, he wouldn't have been successful anyway. But not like Abraham Avinu. Abraham Avinu really tried. He went out of his way to reach out to people. He endangered his life. I mean, you know the stories, right? With Nimrod. To, to stick to his faith, to his emunah. Noah didn't have all that. So Abraham Avinu is much different than Noah. Abraham Avinu does represent the tzaddik that cares about others. That's a much higher level than Noah, who is a tzaddik in his generation, in his way for himself, perhaps in his family. He was saved. But to be such a tzaddik, to be able to save everyone else, to protect everyone else, that, that, that's not an ordinary tzaddik, that's a big tzaddik. It's more zechuyot. That was the kind of tzaddik Abraham Avinu was. So Hashem was willing to wait 
for such a person to come out. Imagine some people, Hashem allows them to live long life, even though they're ashamed, because their children and grandchildren perhaps will become tzaddikim. That is why if a father has children who are not good, he should not dis disinherit them. You're not going to get anything. Because maybe he's a rasha, but he will have a son who will be a Baal Shuba. You see what I mean? So you want to disinherit your grandkids? You don't even know what kind of grandkids you're going to have. You never know what the Shama the grandchild will have. So Hashem waits. Sometimes He waits and sometimes He's patient with people for, for a variety of reasons. So Abraham is called Abraham Ivri. He's the first Jew, in a sense, even though the Jewish people start later on from Yaakov's kids. But he represents the beginning of the Jewish nation because he's the one that fought for the Emunah. He's called Abraham Ivri, who amad me'ever azeh, ve'kola olam me'ever asheni. He's on the one side of the world, on one <laughs> side of the bridge, and everybody else on the other side. In other words, he was willing to fight everyone for what he believed in. And this is the man, therefore, that Hashem says, from him I want to build the world. From him I want to build a nation, later on, called Am Israel, who will basically follow his footsteps of teaching, of belief in one God. Eventually the Arabs followed also, the Christians somewhat too, after Churban Bayit Shani. But in the meantime, the only monotheistic religion in the world is Am Israel. So they are coming from Abraham. They are going in the path of Abraham. They are going to do what Abraham did, in, to teach the world Amitut Hashem, the veracity of one God only. Abraham Avinu in his life had various nisyonot, which leads us to the next Mishnah. Asara nisyonot nitnasa Abraham Avinu alav shalom ve'amad dechulam. This is a very interesting topic in itself. Abraham, again, we have the number 10. And this time it's 10 tests. Abraham Avinu was tested 10 times. Ve'amad bechulam. And he succeeded in all of them. He, flying colors. What is a test? When we hear of a test, we usually think somebody wants to find out if you know something. If you're capable of something, he tests you because he doesn't know. But Hashem knows everything. So when Hashem tests someone, it's not because Hashem needs to find out. You yourself need to find out about yourself. That's something you don't know, perhaps. Hashem doesn't need to find out. Nes, Nisayon is from Lashon Nes. Nes is the staff on the, uh, something w which is tall, high. Nes is Gavoa. Therefore, when a person is going through a nisayon because it's because Hashem wants to elevate him to a higher level. You want to be promoted? Then you have to be tested. What will happen through the test that will make you promoted? Your true potential will come out, potential that could be dormant. If you're not exposed to certain hardships, to certain situations, how do you know you, you have these capabilities? Hashem wants you to realize that you're capable. He will never put you through a test that you cannot go through. He will never make it harder than you can, than what it should be. Always what you can handle. Otherwise, you wouldn't give you something. The test is not fair. But the purpose of the test is to reward us, is to promote us. So if we pass it, we grow, we have grown. This is how we grow spiritually. Not only have we grown, we are rewarded accordingly too because we pass the test. It could be a tremendous kiddush Hashem too. So a test is for us, a test is for others to see that we have done right. A test accomplishes a lot. It's not for Hashem so much. Of course it's a Kiddush Hashem too. But Hashem does not need it to, for Him to find out about us. It is for us to grow. For us to grow spiritually. For us to grow uh, in, in the sense that we are rewarded as well. Plus to allow the potential to come out. Once we are put through a challenging situation, our potential is able to come out and we become stronger as a result of that. And ultimately we are rewarded. But one of the positive things that comes out of a test is that people can learn from it. 
And that is how the Mishnah ends over here. Leodia kama chibato shel Avraham Avinu, alav shalom. It is to show how much love Hashem, how much love Avraham Avinu had for Hashem, how much affection, how much devotion, which is something that we need to learn. Avraham Avinu was prepared to do so. Why is the Torah recording this? Why is the Torah documenting this? Because we're going to need it in the future too. So in reality. People have asked, what was the purpose of the Akedah, which is the last test, Akedat Yitzchak. I mean, it goes against all, everything that Hashem promised Abraham Avinu. I mean, and told him, sacrifice your own child. I mean, the, Abraham Avinu was preaching against it. It was a very, very difficult test because of that. It went against all his beliefs. And Hashem promised him, this is your child, Yitzchak. I mean, it was a difficult test. It was a struggle. So all these tests... What they have in common, but especially the last test of Akedah, is to imbue in us, to implant in us, in the Jewish Neshama, the ability to be prepared to give our lives in the future if necessary. Am Yisrael will be called on later on in Spain, Portugal, in other countries, to perhaps give up their lives for what they believe in. How, how are we going to be so courageous? Where are we going to take this courage from? Akedah Yitzchak. You know, it's from the Nisyanot of our forefathers, they implanted us that ability to, to, to self-sacrifice. Who has that ability? No one has that ability. And even though people say, yeah, but you have suicide bombers. <laughs> suicide bombers is because they promised him 72 virgins. Right? In heaven. That's not, I mean, this is the Shem Shammai for God. Without, forget about the promises. We're doing it because this is the right thing to do. Yare God Yavor to give our lives for something that we believe in, not necessarily because we're going to be rewarded for it, because this is against our principles. Besides the fact that we sacrifice on a daily basis, not just when we're asked for to die, the, our whole routine of mitzvot and fighting for our emunah has been on th going on through history. It's continuous sacrifice. So these, all these Nishonot of Abraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov, every one of them, succeeded also to implant in us the ability to be able to give ourselves in the time of need, to give our lives. It is interesting to note that, especially in the generation of Mashiach, there is a lot of Balei Teshuvah. And these Balei Teshuvah, sometimes, have come from very far away, very distant homes, distant, not knowing anything about Judaism. Where did, they, where did they come from? How did they come to them? I mean, we do know that in the generation of Mashiach, this will be more of a phenomenon that will occur, much more than in the past. If you remember, 40 years ago, some of you remember, you were younger, but you still remember, perhaps, 40 years ago, Baal Teshuvah. You heard about it perhaps once in a while. I mean, you heard it's about Shuba. Today, it's all the time. There's a lot of Balit Shuba today. Thousands and thousands. Just in Israel alone, there's, they say there's about five, six hundred thousand Balit Shuba, real Balit Shuba. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, but it's true. And more and more, Baruch Hashem. So we know that this is part of the Simanim of Mashiach. We know that this is going to happen. And obviously, in order for this to happen in such numbers, there's definitely siyata deshmaya, there's definitely Hashem's help. Some even say that that's the spirit of Eliyahu Navi, as the, as the Prophet says, Yeshiv Levavot Avarim. So he's already coming and helping out somehow uh, on a subconscious level, perhaps. So it could be, we don't know, but it's happening. It is also possible that on a certain level, that's the spark of Abraham Avinu too. On a certain level, that's the spark of Abraham Avinu, of wanting to discover the truth. That spark has been inherited by Am Yisrael. The desire to know the truth. The, the, and the ability to even rebel against the standard norm. You know what it is today, the standard norm? People believe in evolution. People have become atheists today. Big bangs and all kinds of shtuyot that didn't exist 150 years ago especially 200 years ago, where even a lot of Goyim believed in God and creation. So today the Emunah is even more difficult, as it says it will be. And here you have people rediscovering, people not knowing anything. How are they rediscovering? It could be, of course, a grandfather was a big tzaddik, 
There's chutavot. There is the merit of the grandparents. Yes, there's a lot of reasons. This man is a precious neshama too. But also there's a spark of Avraham Avinu. That spark is what we inherited. Look how it all started. It has been transmitted throughout the generations that a Jew should always look out for the truth, always go and discover the truth. And it also is possible that many of the secular Jews, who are still secular or traditional, are fighting for Eretz Israel. They're not fighting for Torah Mitzvot, but they're fighting for Eretz Israel. Why are you fighting for this? It's just a piece of land. But it could be on their level. They're not there yet. They're not yet at the level of fighting for Torah Mitzvot, of returning. But there's a little bit of a spark there for fighting for... Wow, this is our ancestors' land. It's not, they're not just fighting for a piece of land. Well, I'm talking about the, the more traditional ones, the, more the, the people that feel a connection to Israel, not just any Zionist per se. You know, because a lot of Zionists would have been happy with Uganda too, just give them a piece of land anywhere, just get away from Europe, from the ghetto. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the, there are certain Zionists who always felt a connection with the Jewish nation, and with Israel, and they were willing to fight for it, give up their life, they fought. Look at all the wars, soldiers who were really devoted for this cause. What cause? What do you care so much about this? You don't, you don't fulfill mitzvot. No, but this is my people, this is my land. So, wow, why is this so important to you? That spark. That spark that's there, it's been there all along. Just that it's not as burning in the direction of mitzvot or in Munah yet, but it could be one of these days. It definitely has the potential. You look at that devotion, right? So it's, it just has to be directed a little bit better and it will get there. Don't give up on him, therefore. <laughs> but that is something that we are living and experiencing today. We're seeing a tremendous awakening in this spark. And uh, the Prophet says that a lot of Guim are going to want to convert too, especially after Mashiach comes. All of a sudden you're going to see loads and loads of Guim wanting to join us. And the doors will be closed, of course, then, because it will be too obvious. When the whole Shekhinah permeates the entire world, and when the truth comes out, and it's, it's, everybody wants, will be drawn to it. But even before that, you will have apparently a certain awakening among certain groups of non-Jews who feel drawn to this for whatever reason. So Abraham Avinu, Baruch Hashem, withstands all the tests because he loves Hashem. And it's not only important for us to know that he did it because he loved Hashem, it's also important for us to know that the reason Abraham Avinu here is being praised is not because of the many deeds that he performed, but more so be that he was able to withstand the challenge. Because when an individual withstands a challenge, that, is, that shows his greatness much more than the number of deeds that he performs person may be able to pray three times a day for 50 years straight. That's very, very admirable. That is a lot of prayers, perhaps that is a lot of amenim that he answered, a lot of mitzvot that he performed, definitely very, very, very special. But the one who stands out more than that is the one who's challenged, challenged and survives the challenge. That is greater. That is more admirable. So here, the admiration to Avraham Avinu is not necessarily so much the ribuy ma'asim, the amount of deeds that he performed. It is the hibatot, the, the love that he has for so much, that of course, because of the love, he was able to survive the challenges. He succeeded in the challenges. So the admiration is more for the man who proves himself to be loyal as a friend, or loyal to God in times that are very, very difficult and challenging. Avraham Avinu has ten nisyonot. And there's a little bit of a variation as to what those ten nisyonot challenges were. Which one was the first? Some say it was the Kif Shanaesh, that he was thrown into the fire, the furnace. The last one we all know is Akedat Yitzchak. Very difficult one, the most difficult one. However, what the first and last have in common, and not just the first and last, but several others as well, is it's all about emuna. Look at it for a moment and see that Avraham Avinu had to go through very challenging moments in his life 
to support his in support of his emunah. That was he went out against the whole world. He risked his life. He taught it to others. He said, "You guys are crazy," <laughs> and he convinced. He convinced people. And so this whole challenge that comes to him is mostly about emuna. Why? You know, was besides what we said before that uh, that this does, does good to Abraham, it go, does good to us as well. Somehow this was necessary, but there's also a prophecy here, in a sense. What the Hashem is telling us, what the Torah is revealing to us. Look at what Abraham Avinu went through. What our forefathers went through is indicative of what will, what our the children will go through what the descendants of Abraham Avinu were. Throughout the history of the Jewish people, our greatest challenges were about Emunah. Whether it was the Crusades, the Christians that came out against us, whether it was uh, in the pogroms, whether it was uh, Spain and Portugal, and even in the Beit HaMikdash towards the end, the Hurban, because of the lax observant of the mitzvot, that's also a weakening in Emunah. It wasn't just cardinal sins per se that we transgressed. That was in the first Bet Hamidash, perhaps. Abu Dazara, idol worshipping, there were times even before the Bet Hamidash that the people had this Yetzirah for idol worshipping. But here you have a constant, especially in this last long galut, a constant challenge to our emunah from all sides. So this is the challenge, this is the, this is the challenge that we're facing till today. And in the same way that Abraham Avinu went through Kivshan Ha'esh and Akedat Yitzchak, we also went through Kivshan Ha'esh in Auschwitz. They were burnt. Ashes came out from the furnaces. They didn't survive it. They were actually mamash in the Kivshan Ha'esh. So we were thrown to the fire in Spain as well, or in Portugal, in the Alto da Fe. There were many times that the Jew was actually thrown into Kivshan Ha'esh in the same way that Abraham Avinu was. In Akedat Yitzchak, where parents were torn from their kids. Uh, who, who knows how many times this happened in history, unfortunately, when the parents had to witness the kids being taken away, torn away from them. And all kinds of mitot meshunot, very, very uh, unusual kinds of deaths. So the suffering that Am Yisrael has gone through is tremendous. And all of that only because of the emunah, because of who they were and who and what they represented. Imagine Hitler and Shemot. You know, gotta get, get, gotta eliminate these people and their beliefs. What do you have against them? If, if anything, they contributed to your economy. You know, they're blaming us exactly the opposite of what we were doing right, because it bothers them. It bothers, the whole going bothers what? What bothered the generation of Abraham, of Abraham Avinu? This guy is different from us. He believes in something completely different from us. Our emunah bothers the goy, even though, I, as I said many times, if the Jew would be doing the mitzvot perfectly, as it says in Bechukotai Telechu, the goy will not harm us at all, even though they're bothered, even though they're jealous. <coughs> but if a Jew doesn't do his emunah right, he does not perform right, and still calls himself Jewish, that bothers the goy. Be like us then. You understand? In other words, why are you standing apart? If you would stand apart, but you would really be who you really claim to be, that's different. If we would be like Abraham Avinu all the way, 100%, <laughs> nobody, nobody would be able to do anything against us. As it is, we see Baruch Hashem, the miracles of Hashem, because of the many chasadim that Hashem does with us, the nisim v'niflaot, the schut avod, and the merits of our forefathers. We suffered enough. We see tremendously the ashgachah that Hashem protects us, despite all the suffering. But... What stands out, and what we have to pay attention, is look at the challenge, the greatest challenge that you will have and has had, but especially will have even more during the days of Mashiach, a challenge to his emunah, to be strong, not to be broken, not to, not to let down your guard, not to be depressed and sad that there's no parnasah, people are struggling, people are not married, people are still single, some people don't have kids, some people have no shalom bai. There's a lot of problems going on today that is affecting people's emunah because they have a lack of bitachon, of course. The emunah is not strong enough. So this is a challenge too. How do you explain it? You know what I tell people? To people who are single? Believe me, Hashem wants you to get married much more than you do. 
he wants it more than we do, the parents. He wants it more than the single person, man or woman. He wants it more. And then somehow, after we tried, of course, I'm assuming people have tried, and somehow it doesn't happen, maybe it's a tikkun. In this generation of Mashiach is going to go through tikkunim. Remember, Moshe Cordovero says that. Before Mashiach comes, a lot of people are going to go, be going through all kinds of tikkunim, refining them. You know why? Because we are the ones that are going to see Mashiach. And in order for us to be worthy of seeing Mashiach, our generation, what big tzaddikim before us did not see it. Even though it's through their credit that we're going to see it, nonetheless, to be worthy, we have to be pure. So there's no more time for Gilgulim. We don't want another Holocaust, Chaz Shalom as a tikkun. So there's all kinds of other tikkunim, small scale, poverty, loss of a job, struggle here, illnesses of all kinds, and Hashem knows who to give what. And all of this is a challenge. All of that is an isayon. So even though a lot of people throughout our history have become weak, and not everyone was able to withstand the challenges all the time. Some Jews gave up. The only reason we survived as a nation is because Baruch Hashem, there were many who did not give up. Right? So it's Bishud, those who did not give up, who followed in the path of Avraham Avinu, or were standing all the challenges that Baruch Hashem was still around. And that is in itself the, the most valuable lesson of all. That in this, the, the spirit of Avraham, of Avraham Avinu still lives on spirit of self-sacrifice, of devotion, that if he can do it, we can do it. Otherwise, why tell us about it? Maybe he was a great hero. No, if he can do it, you can do it. What's so, so special about him? Because he was devoted. It was, he had clarity. He understood it. And he was willing to do everything to fight for it. Why can't we do it? Of course we could do it. If we want to, we could do it. And that challenge to him, now we also have in different ways, perhaps. They're not, gonna, they're not about to throw us in the Kibshan Ha'esh. But there's other kifshaneish, you know, all the, 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 the furnaces of heresy that are out there. That's also, that's also a furnace, not fire, but a different kind of a spiritual fire, which is worse. So we, we have to be careful. We have to be, realize that we're always being challenged. Not that Hashem wants to challenge us and test us. It's just that life in itself is a challenge. But Bezat Hashem, by learning of the ways of Avraham Avinu, Bezat Hashem, we will be able to take what he had, the self-sacrifice, the devotion, the love for Hashem, and apply it to our lives as well. Amen. Amen.